Here for number 11, we have a reaction mechanism question. Okay, so we have this three-step reaction, and they tell us that the second step is the slow step. So each of the steps, they give us our elementary reactions, which means they just happen in one go. And it means that we can just take each step and write the rate law with the given stoichiometry. So they tell us the second step is slow, which means that's the rate determining step. Ooh, which I did not spell right. Rate determining. And so the other reactions are only going to happen as fast as that reaction goes. So we can start by writing our rate law with this step that determines what the rate is. Law of rate is equal to K times N2O2 times H2. Okay, so that seems fine, but we can't leave this intermediate in our rate law. We want to write it in terms of things that are actually in our reaction. Okay, and this doesn't show up in the overall reaction, so we don't want to include it. And so we can look at the reaction above the first step, and we see that it's kind of stuck behind this reaction. It's waiting for the slow reaction to happen so it can go. And while it's waiting, we're kind of just like bouncing back and forth between the two directions. So just bouncing back and forth while it waits for its turn to move on to the next step. And so what we'll say is that this is at equilibrium, going back and forth, and that the rate forward is equal to the reverse rate. And so what we can do is write a rate expression for the forward and set it equal to the rate react or rate expression for the reverse. Okay, so we'll have then oops. We'll have for the forward, we'll have K forward times N O squared. So they wrote it as N O plus N O. That's the same as two N O. So that would be squared. And we're going to set this equal to the reverse. So I'll write k here, and I'll say minus 1 for the reverse. And that's going to be times n2, o2. Okay. And that's useful because it gives us a way to relate the n2, o2 from the rate determining step to the reactant, which is the NO. Okay, so don't worry about the case too much. Unless you take like a, a physical chemistry class later on, we'll just combine all of these into one overall K and not get too specific with them. But we'll take this side, which is going to be equal to the N2O2, and just replace it there. So our rate will actually be equal to some new and different k, but just a k, times our NO squared times just H2. Okay, so the key for these is just to start by writing a rate law for the slow step. See what you need to get rid of. Use the reaction above to write a rate forward equals rate reverse expression, and then do the substitution. So here the answer is D. So now we're using the same mechanism for 12, 
but they're asking us what the role of N2O is in the reaction. Let me erase some of this. So let's find the N2O. We see it made here oops, in the second step. And then we use it again in the third step. So we made it and then got rid of it. And so this is going to be the definition of an intermediate. Okay. We would know it were a catalyst if it were used and then regenerated. Okay, so sometimes the difference between those two can be a little tricky. Oh, and that's the perfect lead-in to question 13, where they're asking us what's true about catalysts. And so, we haven't quite talked about KEQ yet, but here it says a catalyst increases the value of the equilibrium constant. So, we'll talk more about this, but KEQ is all about like, the ratio of products to reactants when you reach equilibrium. And a catalyst doesn't change that. Okay, So keep that in mind. Catalysts don't change the equilibrium constant. And they also don't change... Oh, sorry. They don't change the delta E. Okay. What catalysts do is lower the activation energy by changing the mechanism, thus speeding up a reaction. And so we could see this on a reaction coordinate diagram where we have reaction progress. into energy. And we can have our normal reaction. So this would be uncatalyzed. And then the catalyzed reaction, we'd start with the same energy and then we would just have some different mechanism lowering the activation energies and we would end at the same energy so we'd have a constant delta E. In this case it's negative. Okay so the answer here is just B. In number 14 we have another reaction to balance, a nuclear reaction. And so they tell us that we have uranium-238. So I looked at the periodic table to get the atomic number of 92. And it's going to undergo five alpha decays. So I wrote, wrote that in. And two beta decays. And they want us to figure out what element we'll be left with, what isotope. We'll have some unknown guy there. Okay, so we want to make sure we have the same number of atomic particles on the left as on the right. And so we only have one thing on the left, so it's pretty clear that we have 238 and 92 on the left. So on the right, we'll have, from the alpha decay, We'll have 20 on the mass number. And then this will be like 10 for the atomic number. But then we'll have minus 2 because of the beta. And so we will have 8 here as the number of protons that we're accounting for. And so if we look at the difference between these, we'll get the number that our new isotope must have. So if we just look at the difference, we have 218. 
and we have 84. Okay, so from that we can tell that it's either B or C, and to figure out whether it's lead or polonium, we look at the periodic table and see that element number 84 is polonium. So we'll have polonium, oops, that should be a little O, 218, atomic number 84. So this is C. So the nuclear stuff, as long as you know your types of decay, it's just as simple as making sure you have the same atomic particles on the left as on the right. Okay, so you guys, most of you are probably too young to remember the big ozone uh, worry and CFCs, but they used to be in hairspray, any kind of aerosols, and in air conditioning units and refrigerators and stuff. And then people realized that they were damaging the ozone layer, which protects us from UV light. And you can see the reaction there. And so if we look at the reaction, we can see that the chlorine radical goes in and is then regenerated. And so when something is used and regenerated, it's a catalyst, which I think I sort of already gave away. But you can see that in the mechanism too. Okay. And so because it's regenerated, it's not just a reactant. And by acting as a catalyst, it actually will lower the activation energy. So the transition state would actually be at a lower energy. So C doesn't make sense. So ClO is made and then used, which makes it an intermediate. And then E, it's not a product either, really. Um, so E is out. It's just B. Okay, so here we have glucose consumption, which is something that we all do all the time every day. And they give us the rate of glucose consumption, and they want us to figure out the rate of production for carbon dioxide. So we have to figure out a way to compare these two and relate them. So the way we do that is with the stoichiometry. So the rate of change for glucose It's going to look slower than the rate for CO2 because when every one glucose goes away, six CO2 appear. Okay, so we have to make them look normal by dividing the rate, or not normal, but equal by making the CO2 rate look slower. And so that's where this dividing by the stoichiometric coefficient comes into play. Sorry, that looks like a CO3, but it was meant to be a CO2. Okay, so since CO2 is generated six times faster, we divide it by six to make it equal to the glucose rate. So we'll have to divide it by six. Okay. And so if we want to figure out the rate for the CO2 production all on its own, we'll just multiply the 6 over to just have the rate of CO2 production. Okay. 
So we'll have 6 times this 0.12 moles per second. And that ends up being 0.72 moles per second. Which is answer choice E. Okay, so here we have a lead dating problem where we have this rock and it's a mixture of uranium and lead. And so we know that uranium can undergo some radioactive decays. And there's a chart in the ebook that goes through the exact decays, but it's pretty complicated. You have a mixture of alpha and beta decays. And you end up making lead. And you do this in a one-to-one -one ratio. Okay. And so they're asking us how old the rock is, which is it just means we're trying to find T. And we know that uh, nuclear kinetics always follow first order kinetics. And so we can think of this as the ln of, and for nuclear we use n instead of a, same idea, doesn't matter. So the ln of nt over n naught is equal to negative kt. And so we can find k pretty easily to start using the half-life. So we'll have that t1 half which is equal to 4.51 times 10 to the 9 years is equal to 0 0.693 over k. And k ends up equaling this 1.54 times 10 to the negative 10 inverse years. Okay, so now we need to think about the moles of uranium that we have when we find this rock, which will be Nt. And then we'll have to go ahead and figure out the moles of uranium that we initially started with. So I think Nt is more straightforward because we just take what we have now. Okay, so NT we will find by just taking our 2.7 grams uranium and then we'll have one mole uranium and they tell us this is uranium-238 so we can just use the 238 and find that we have 0 0.0113 moles of uranium to begin. Or I'm sorry, left, left. Okay, so I'm gonna reorganize the information we have a little bit to make room. So now we have most of the components that we need to solve for time in our integrated first order rate law, but we need to figure out how much uranium we started with. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky. So we're going to look at our reaction up here and see that we just, it's a one to one ratio between the moles of lead and moles of uranium. And so what we can do is convert the moles of lead, or the grams of lead into moles, and then convert that to moles of uranium. So we have our 
0.72 grams of lead. And we'll get one mole of lead for every 206 grams. And we'll have now for every one mole of lead. One mole of uranium. And so when you solve this, you get 0 0.0085 moles of uranium. So these are just the moles of uranium that started as lead. And so to really get the total numbers of moles of uranium, we'll have to add what uranium we have left to the uranium that became lead. And so we'll have our 0.113 moles plus our 0 0.0085 moles. To get us our original uranium, which is 0 0.01, well, let's just round it to 0 0.02 moles uranium. Okay, so I'll mark that up here. Okay, and so now we have everything that we need in our integrated first order rate law expression, and we'll go ahead and solve for t. Okay, so I went ahead and plugged every all of our variables into the natural log expression. And now we can go ahead and solve for t. Okay, so when you solve or evaluate this natural log, you get that this side is equal to negative 0.552 and so it's equal to our negative k t and then you just divide the left side by k and find that the answer is B. So these problems are long and there's a lot of data to keep track of. So try to come up with a system to help you keep track of all of your variables and the values that you solve for. Okay, And practice this one without the video. You should do all of them without the video, but practice this one especially and make sure you can get through the calculations and keep everything organized.